Hi, I'm Zoe Blade and here's some basic music theory tips in five simple steps. Now this is really intended for beginners to uh, making music. Uh, certainly when I started out making music I had what's known as tracker software which is kind of like having a sampler and a sequencer and I was very enthusiastic and equally had a, a complete lack of music knowledge which was probably holding me back to begin with. Uh, I made uh, quite a, a few interesting rackets but all my friends were like oh my god this is really out of tune please stop so uh, this is kind of what I kind of wish I could go back in time and tell myself then because really learning a, a little bit of basic music theory can uh, help you to make music which is in tune uh, and if you can kind of internalize uh, that kind of thing at the same time as remembering uh, to be creative and experimental and weird then uh, it's, it's a much better combination than just being weird and out of tune. So uh, this is uh, kind of advice that I'm hoping I can pass on to anyone who is now where I was back then. So step one is absolute basics. Uh, try starting out with just drums, no pitches at all. You can't be out of tune if you don't play a tune. So use atonal percussion and weird sounds only, make a glorious mess. This is, you know, how I started off, just sampling weird sounds around the house, stuff like that. It's a good starting point where you can't really do anything wrong. It's a, a nice way of just kind of, you know, easing yourself into it. So you can get creative with sampling household items and wiring up synth patches, uh, get creative and experimental with rhythms as well. Just, just really, you know, experiment as much as you can before you even introduce pitched notes. Uh, so many Aphex Twin does this, such as the Garden of Lynn Mary. And, you know, that was good enough that they used it in an advert for tires. So there you go. You, you can do stuff with that even before you, you get into the, the kind of proper music making. Okay, step two is to add some pitch notes at last uh, from any one key. Uh, so let's go to notebook.zoeblade.com where I sketch out my ideas and find the circle of fifths page. Okay, so notebook and circle of fifths at the top there. Okay, so this is a page I made that teaches you the circle of fifths. Um, Here's a musical keyboard with all the notes. You see we've got two black keys and then three black keys and then it repeats. Uh, if you look just to the left of uh, the two black keys, that's always a, a C. So first of all, if we tick notes, uh, it highlights in blue and on the keyboard there, which notes uh, in any given key. So we could change from say C major to D flat major or E minor and it will tell you which notes are in that key and which ones aren't. So what we're going to do is pick any one key and only play the notes that are in that particular key. Uh, to make things even simpler, I'm just going to pick the key of C major because that's just the white notes and that's really easy to remember. Okay, so uh, if we look at all the notes on the keyboard or any other instrument of choice, uh, right, they're named after letters of the alphabet. Starting at C, uh, I'm not entirely clear why, perhaps the agents also likes the, the white notes I don't know right so uh, if we start at oh, it's a bit dusty right if we start at C uh, and work our way across we can see just the white notes from the key of C which is these so that's C D E F G A B C and then it repeats because every one of these is called an octave and it's the same notes as before only uh, twice as fast in, in terms of uh, when the, the sound vibrates, the air vibrating. Uh, similarly in C minor, uh, you've got uh, similar uh, notes starting at C, but it's got slightly different ones. It's got some of the black ones as well. Now, uh, as far as the names of the black notes are concerned, these are known as sharps or flats. Uh, and it depends on context. Uh, this note here, for instance, between C and D is known either as C sharp or D flat, depending on the context. Uh, as for what the context is, uh, people like it when they're like picking which notes are in a scale, if each letter's only there once. So if you've already got, say, uh, a C, but you haven't got a D, then this is gonna be D flat. It's not gonna be C sharp because you've already got a C. And similarly, if you've got a D, uh, but you haven't got a C, then this is going to be a, a C sharp because you've already got a D. 
that's the names of the notes. So the, the white ones always have the same names and the black ones, their names change uh, based on which key you're in, but it's the same note. C sharp is a D flat, it's just context. It's just got two names for the same note. So if you ever hear musicians uh, practicing their scales, that's all they're doing is they're playing all the notes in a particular key. So they'll pick a key and they'll just play all the notes in it and then back down again like that. Uh, if we make the attack a bit quicker. Or for the minor one. And that's just the keys of uh, C and C minor. You've got, you've got all of them starting on all the different notes. So, you know, you can go to D. So, because that's the key of D that starts on D, so you always start on the note of whichever key it's in. Anyway, we'll go back to C major because I know that one. Back when I learned the guitar as a teenager, this is the one key I learned. And a lot of early techno and house music, uh, I think generally just uh, is based around this kind of idea. Uh, when you make a track, you pick a key and you stick to just those seven notes and then everything will be in tune. Uh, if you don't progress beyond that point, uh, it's a, a bit of a shame, but you can uh, make quite an, a lot of lovely music. Uh, just by sticking to a key and only using notes in that key and not really thinking about anything else. So for example, if I just play the white notes and don't play any two next to each other, uh, just you know, avoid the neighbors, it's gonna sound good. Th those are all nice chords that go together. So um, just by doing that, you can make some solid music. That's a good start. So practice doing that. That's the uh, second step. Okay, so after making a, a few songs, with notes from a key, you're gonna get a bit bored, so we move on to step three, uh, adding some chords uh, from that key. Uh, just as uh, you've got uh, 12 notes in an octave and the keys, uh, seven of them that you're using in particular as a subset, uh, we can further make a subset, uh, which is a chord. So out of the 12 notes in an octave, uh, the seven notes that uh, sound nice together uh, are called a key, and out of those you can pick uh, three of the notes to make a chord in particular so it's kind of a subset of a subset and that's the red ones in the diagram so each key has for our simple purposes six chords uh, three major three minor for example in the key of C major you have uh, the chord C major uh, oh and you can see what they are on, on this website here if you just hover over it uh, then it will tell you which notes are in each chord and it will highlight them in red on the keyboard here. So, uh, the key of C major has these six chords. C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, and A minor. Uh, at any given time, if you make sure all your instruments are playing only the three notes of a particular chord, uh, they're going to sound even more in tune with each other than they would by using the seven notes of the key. Uh, and also we can have a chord progression. So we can say, pick four chords that sound nice after each other and we can loop through them. And then you can just you know loop those four chords and at any given time you're just playing the notes from that particular chord on all the different instruments and all the different parts that's going to sound really harmonious and really in tune now you can use notes that are outside of that particular chord um, but uh, in the key you, and they'll sound okay but not as in tune as if you were sticking to the notes of the chord uh, you can play notes outside of the key as well which will sound slightly more out of tune and these are all valid things you can do but generally you want to mostly be using the notes that are in the chord and then a little bit less using the notes that are in the key but not the chord and a little bit less using the notes that aren't in either so this isn't uh, necessarily the starting point but at some point when you're working on a track you say you've made a, a nice rhythm and you've got you know, a nice little bass line and a, and a nice uh, you know jump part and that that's sounding quite good you've got a cool groove going uh, you probably want to pick a chord and then kind of change all the notes so they're in that chord or most of them are in that chord and then uh, you can come up with say uh, four 
different chords that go nicely one after the other and then you can copy and paste uh, that bar and then change all the notes so that they're in the first chord and then the notes in the second chord and then the notes in the third and then in the fourth and so that's how most I think popular music works it's basically just kind of transposing the notes to the first chord and the second and the third and the fourth uh, especially when you do that with the bass line and with the the backing uh, with the, the leads like with the vocal uh, I think you more often want to kind of violate that uh, the, the chords and just keep it more in the key but not the chords and you know have more fun with it uh, but certainly for the backing it kind of emphasizes what chord it is at any given time if uh, quite a few of the parts at least are in that chord in particular. As I say this is not a hard and fast rule. Uh, you can uh, have little flourishes, little out of tune, you know, little out of chord or out of key parts here and there. That's okay as long as mostly uh, the most prominent notes, the loudest notes, uh, the, the notes that are in sync with the kick drum and snare drum, those kinds of notes, that the main notes are uh, in uh, the the chords that's probably going to sound better so if the chords are doing C and then an E then the the bass line could have a little D in between very quickly just to kind of you know bridge the gap between them you could do things like that you can have little flourishes and segues that are kind of you know quote unquote out of tune uh, as long as it's not too much that is you know, th there's no rule that you have to really strictly adhere to it's more about most of the stuff being in tune most of the time sounds really good in tune it's more in key than in tune <laughs> tune your instruments first <laughs> uh, another thing to bear in mind is that i was kind of oversimplifying when i was kind of suggesting earlier on that uh, uh, each chord should last a bar uh, you could have say each chord lasts exactly one bar exactly two bars or half a bar but you can have fun with it you could say have a chord progression of so you know the the third and fourth chords would be the same one you could do that they shouldn't necessarily all be exactly the same length you could alternate lengths There's no rules, try things out, experiment. Uh, as a general thumb rule, as long as all the parts are mostly conforming to a particular chord at any given time, anything else goes out the window, experiment and go crazy, work out what you like personally. So yeah, different chords can be different lengths and you don't need to repeat every four chords. You can have any number of chords. You don't need to repeat uh, every four bars. You can have any number of bars. You know, you could have say, I'm going to have chords one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Then again, have another two chords, five and six. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six. That would be interesting. Then you get into things like prog rock and Radiohead, where they start to, you know, do really wacky things. Uh, if you want to do weird and wacky things, do. Uh, if you don't, that's fine too. There's no right or wrong answers. Just, you, you know, it's more of an art than a science please do experiment and try things out and see what works for you personally. Uh, another thing to remember about chords is that you can invert them. So say you've got uh, uh, an E minor. Uh, it's made of E, uh, E, G and B. Uh, we can instead start it on the G and then the B and then we go up to this E here. So we kind of rotated it. Or start it on, uh, what's that? Uh, B, then the E, then the G. These are all the same chords because they're the same three notes. It doesn't really matter which one's the lowest and which one's the highest. And this is a, a really useful thing you can do. Uh, it's one of the things I like the most because it's one of those instances where being lazy sounds better. And that's a great combination, like lay motif. So say you want to go from C major to E minor. That sounds quite nice. Uh, but instead of that, uh, if we use an inversion of E major, uh, we could use the B that's below it instead of above. Uh, that would be the same chord. It's, it's just, you know, upside down C, but it's the same chord. Now that means when we go from C major to E minor, uh, we can keep this note, we can keep this note, we can keep our fingers exactly where they are. This is the only 
think it'll be changing, this is only note we're changing. So it's the exact same chord progression, but it sounds uh, kind of simpler uh, because we're only moving that, you know, the thumb. So let's see, we can emphasize that they're different chords further by uh, having the, the bass note repeated down here. And then it goes to E. Okay, so. That's nice. This is the kind of reason why I tend to make very uh, arpeggiated synthetic music, but I tend not to use the arpeggiator. Uh, I tend to draw it in manually so that A, I can build up a, a nice kind of rhythm of my own choosing. So instead of like do 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 do, like this, I, I can make it, you know, any order I like. And also, when it comes to changing chords, I can work out how many notes I can get away with not changing. And when you do something like that, that starts to sound quite nice. So just by having chord progressions, uh, that's going to make your music much better. And you know, if, if you haven't really done that before, you're just starting out, please make a bunch of tracks uh, that way try it out until you get bored of it then move on to the next step. So once you're bored of just using uh, chord progressions you can move on to step four uh, which is where things get really interesting uh, and add different sections and this basically brings your music up to the standard of quite a lot of pop music. When you want to switch sections and we'll get to what those are in a second, uh, when you want to switch sections kind of depends a bit on the genre. Uh, when it comes to uh, pop music uh, it, it's very specific can happen in quite uh, often. When it comes to say house and techno music you might have just one section and that's the entire track. Uh, you could have say uh, one section for like the first half and then another section for the second half. As a general rule of thumb uh, once the music starts to get too boring and repetitive that's when you want to switch things up a bit and there's two ways you can do that. The easiest way is to add another part, so you add another instrument. Uh, the other way is to switch to a new section or switch back to a previous section. Uh, another reason why you can stay one section for longer in electronic music is because it has dynamic timbres because uh, with a, a glorious uh, synthesizer such as this thing behind me here uh, you can uh, change the sounds on the fly. It's going to sound interesting for longer. Whereas with most music, it doesn't really have that luxury. If people are playing the, the same notes, they're going to sound the same with, with most music. So they really don't have that luxury. They can't get away with it. They need to change section much more often. So it really depends on what kind of music you're making, how often you need to change uh, section. Okay, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but it's kind of bears repeating a bit. Uh, when it comes to electric, electronic music, a lot of it uh, will just kind of build things up and up and up. So you're listening to say just a bass line and then they'll add in like say the kick and snare and then they'll add in the hi-hat. So you could have say your four chords, four bars uh, looping and then you add in another part, loop them again and you can build it up that way. But eventually you're going to want to add in uh, you know something a bit more interesting uh, eventually, you know, it gets stale and boring, like, okay, yeah, I've heard this enough, it sounds repetitive. You want to freshen things up, uh, go to a new section. When it comes to most of the drummers of music, they don't really build things up that much. Maybe when you're listening to a verse, we'll have the four chords once, and then they'll add in, say, a hi-hat or something, play the same four chords again, and then go to the chorus. But generally uh, they're not going to repeat it a whole bunch of times adding in a whole bunch more things you only get away with that about once in a pop song uh, Nine Inch Nails are good for that you listen to the verse it's like okay yeah here's the verse and then you, basically it's different lyrics now but it's going to be the exact same instruments again and add another one on top you know yeah just a little rhythm or something just add interest to it or lay on another um, guitar riff, something like that. Uh, and then once even that's starting to sound repetitive, then they go over to a chorus. So yeah, it depends on the genre when you want to do this, it depends on your taste when you want to do this, but your music is going to sound really interesting once you start adding in different sections. Okay, so what does a different section consist of? Um, 
probably it will consist of a, uh, a different chord progression. So you found four chords you like and you found another four chords you like, or even the same ones in a different order. Uh, you could say, well, my, my A part is going to be the first four chords and then the B part, once we get bored of that, we're going to play these other four chords instead. Um, that's the main thing is you switch over from one chord progression to another one. So that's probably what you're going to change most of all uh, in the next section. Uh, possibly uh, the next section might be in a different key. That's another thing you can do. And uh, in terms of which key you might want to switch over to, uh, you see how you've got these uh, six chords in the key of C. Those are also the names of uh, six keys that you can change to for another section uh, without it sounding that different, it sounded quite seamless. Uh, I haven't really looked at the circle of fifths much yet myself, so the way I've been doing it is just uh, so uh, the last chord in my progression is whatever, say uh, G major, I just look up what other keys have a G major in and switch to one of those for the next section. Uh, but this is probably going to be better, so I'm going to try this out. Another thing that a different section might have is different instruments or playing different parts on those instruments. So, you know, you can have uh, different rhythms, different instruments, just mix things up a bit, make things fresh. Like, say, uh, the last track I wrote, which I th think is the, yeah, the one I'm going to be recording more of next week, uh, largely consists of, say, we got an 808 kind of drum kit, um, we've got all these uh, modular synth sounds for the A section. For the B section, uh, we actually slow it down to a different tempo, I think. We go from 100 BPM to 80, that's kind of weird by itself. Uh, and we begin the string machine, which isn't in the A section, it's only in the B section. Uh, it's a more dramatic chord progression and uh, we kind of slow down the rhythm as well as the tempo. And I think the string machine sounds so kind of dramatic and interesting, I kind of had to slow it down to, to make it sound good. Because you don't want to rush through these things, uh, especially if you uh, slow down the attack and release. There we go, that's nice. So you have things like that, you, you know, you're going to want to change the tempo to, to something it's going to sound good in. Always, you know, go with what sounds good. Don't worry about what you're supposed to do. Just, you know, trust your own judgment. Uh, you know, what people like about your music is your taste and your ability to achieve it. So you're picturing something you like and then you're turning that into reality. So pop music tends to be very formulaic and it has uh, almost always exactly uh, this uh, combination of sections. Intro, verse, chorus, verse again, chorus again, bridge, uh, chorus, chorus, outro, and that's all it does. <laughs> Intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, chorus, outro. And if you listen to a lot of pop songs, most of them will follow that formula. So you can work out, you know, four chords you like, that's your verse, another four chords you like, that's your chorus, another thing, and that's your, your bridge. Perfectly, you know, more chord progressions a lot of the time with uh, some electronic music, the bridge is where it kind of breaks down and they'll just be like, oh, well, we'll take the drum loop and we'll just phase it and there, that's interesting. It, it, yeah, you can do better than that. So um, then the intro and outro tend to be something like, say, the same thing as the verse or the chorus, but without as many instruments, that kind of thing, just something to get you going, just sort of ramp it up and then wind it down again afterwards. Once you're aware of this and you listen out for it, uh, you'll notice that everywhere. Quite a few songs, though, will break out of that formula. Uh, even within the realms of pop music, uh, if you listen to any made by Xenomania, uh, who made music for Sugar Babes and Girls Aloud, they used to break out of that quite a bit. Uh, if you look at, say, uh, Red Dress, that had what they considered to be two choruses. And I think it's somewhat arbitrary what you name them, whether this is like a pre-chorus and a chorus or a chorus and a post-chorus. That's not really a thing, but maybe that's what it is. It doesn't really matter what you call it, but the point is they kind of had these two different parts where the chorus would be one after the other. And it was especially cool because they did this thing where uh, when they go from the first part of the chorus to the second part, uh, part of the music is winding down with the other parts cranking up. So part of it's going like, bah, 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 bah. Another part's going like, bah, 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 bah. and it it's really messes with your mind. It's, it's, it's a great song. So, uh, so again, main key thing to take home here is um, 
here's a bunch of uh, tricks you can use, but also try doing different things as well. This is just, you know, what to kind of fall back on and practice and intuit. Uh, do it so much that you can do it on a subconscious level and then you do other things in addition to kind of break out of that when you want to. But because you know what you're doing, uh, when you break out of it, it'll be on purpose and it'll be in a really cool way. Now, uh, the thing about making the different sections sound really different from each other to freshen up the music is it can be a bit jarring when you go from one to the other. So what you can do is you can gloss over the seams. So you could have, say, if there's an instrument that's in the B section, but not the A section, then you can kind of introduce the instrument just in the, the last bar of the, of the A section, just before you go into the B section. or or you could have another part just arrive a bit late and generally it's a good idea if your instruments don't all arrive at the beginning of the bar the temptations there because that's really easy to do in the door but you know bear in mind uh, music is like uh, a bunch of different instruments having a conversation together and each one's kind of chiming in with their opinion and generally uh, each one kind of talks as it were when the others aren't so it's like they're having a conversation so uh, you only want, uh, say, the foundation, like the, the drums and the bass, they can be locked in together. They, they generally are in agreement and reinforcing each other. But other parts can be kind of filling in the blanks and those can start and stop, say, halfway through a bar. So in terms of other instruments talking to each other, some can arrive a bit early, some can arrive a bit late, and then you don't notice so much when uh, you change sections, like the topic changing, I suppose. I don't know, I haven't thought about the metaphor that much. <laughs> Uh, one of my favourite things I did was in Hand in Hand, uh, where the singer sings like, we'll go hand in hand, in hand, and, and reaches up this really high note, and that high note, which I can't do, and that high note in particular uh, is uh, from the next section. So uh, she's singing the chorus, hand in hand, and then it goes back to the uh, verse, bah, 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 bah. And when she sings the very last hand, that's a note from the verse, not the chorus, because that's what's playing now. And that happens to have a note that's like the next one up from the note she was singing in the previous section. So it allows the chorus by kind of outstaying its welcome and lasting to overlapping with the next verse, it allows it to reach a slightly higher note, which sounds really cathartic and amazing. And I, I really, yeah, like that part. That, that was something that worked out really well. So, you know, these are kind of, you know, things you can work out that sound good over lots of practice and experimentation. Okay, that leads us to our fifth and final tip in music theory, which is that you can borrow uh, chords from other keys. So if you're in the key of C and you can play all these chords, you can actually play all these ones as well. And we've got those highlighted in green. And if you move your mouse over them again, it will highlight them in green. It will show you what notes are in there. And I haven't done this too much myself yet. I'm looking forward to trying this out. Um, just, you know, to mix things up a bit, make them more interesting. You don't have to always stick to six chords in any given section. You can have outside chords, which uh, a lot of people do. And that's probably a sign you're, you know, a, a more worldly knowledgeable professional musician. That's something I'm going to be trying out next. So I can't really tell you too much about that because I haven't really done it myself yet, but I'm looking forward to trying it and learning with you. So uh, that's pretty much all the, the music theory I know. Uh, it's simplified and incomplete. And I'm sure anyone who's up, you know, really into music will, will tell me that, that I'm a fool who doesn't know much. And yeah, true, but I know enough to make the kind of music I want to make with this. And it's a lot better than if you just, you know, you've, you've got a, a 303 clone and you're, you're playing random notes. At bare minimum, just go here and, and just select a key and, and play in only the blue notes, that will sound better right away instantly. That's all I know. Uh, this is simplified and incomplete, but this should be enough to make some solid pop music at least. I think the takeaway message is if you stick to uh, a given uh, chord uh, with most of uh, the instruments, what they're playing at any given time, and outside of that stick to the key, and outside of that, you know, go wild, mostly have everything in tune to the chord, have a few outliers that are still in key and very few outliers that are out of key, then things will sound much better. And any notes that don't really belong there, you're doing on purpose instead of by accident, that will, you know, 
that can only benefit you to know what you're doing and when you're breaking a rule know that you're breaking it and have a fairly good idea of why you're breaking it so uh, if you'd like to learn more uh, please ask someone who knows more than me because that's about all I know uh, books are probably a good start uh, personally I'm much better at producing and engineering electronic music which is what I'm mostly going to focus on all, all this stuff patching parts uh, I just thought it'd be good to uh, show you some music theory first so that when you want to wire up a patch and play a tune on it you kind of know a bit about how to make a tune that is in June.